is the devotion for the week of April 3rd. We begin with one of the well-known Lenten hymns. Glory be to Jesus, who in bitter pains poured for me the lifeblood from his sacred veins. Grace and life eternal in that blood I find. Blessed be his compassion, infinitely kind. Blessed through endless ages be the precious stream, which from endless torments did the world redeem. Abel's blood for vengeance pleaded to the skies, but the blood of Jesus for our pardon cries. Oft as earth exulting lifts its praise on high, angels hosts rejoicing make their glad reply. Lift we then our voices, swell the mighty flood, louder still and louder, praise the precious blood. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our devotion for tonight is based on John 19, beginning at verse 14. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They shouted, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. So then Pilate handed Jesus over to be crucified. So they took Jesus away. Carrying his own cross, he went out to what is called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had a notice written and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. This is God's word. We pray, Lord, consecrate us for your service through the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Take him away. Three words that show the truth of Isaiah's prophecy. He was despised and rejected by men. Take him away. Three words that show the truth of Jesus' prediction. They will mock me, mistreat me, spit on me, flog me, and kill me. Take him away. Three words that show the truth of St. John's observation. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. As the basis for this devotion, we read the final farewell the city gave Jesus. Shouts of anger and hatred, shouts calling for his death. Satan was mightily at work, pouring out his hatred through the voices of the people. Take him away, they shout. But God was also at work that day, accomplishing what he set out to do. As he's taken away, Jesus is leaving the crowd with its worldly cravings, and moving forward the Father's plan to give lasting blessings. Jesus is leaving behind the crowd with his worldly cravings. How can we even begin to account for the utter hatred of Jesus of Nazareth? What had he done besides heal the sick, cure the blind, make the lame walk, drive out demons, feed thousands, raise dead people, and most important, preach the word of God? What evil is in any of that? There is none. In the final analysis, what Jesus had told his disciples that night was dead on. They hated me without reason. You know, there are so many in this world who believe that people are naturally good, or at least that we are born into this world as a clean slate, and that it's our environment that shapes us into good or bad people. A Harvard psychologist recently wrote that at our core, quote, we all have a true self that is kind, compassionate, caring, and calm, unquote. 
You have to wonder if that guy ever read a newspaper or watched a TV news broadcast. In spite of the foolish things psychologists might say, here in the crowd of Jerusalem we see what the sinful nature is capable of. The sinful flesh is hostile to God, St. Paul wrote. And there was never a day more filled with hostility than when sinful people, both Jews and Gentiles, crucified the innocent Son of God. Jesus picked up his own cross and left the, the world and left the crowd to its worldly cravings. What were the people craving? His blood. Sure, but the reason they were craving that was because they feared that Jesus was disrupting their earthly relationship with the powers of the day and endangering their peace, security, and prosperity. The Sanhedrin had said, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. You see, their thoughts were about this world, this life. The chief priests ought to have been helping the people focus on the eternal relationship with God. But as our text says, it was the chief priests who answered, We have no king but Caesar. Caesar, who ruled with his brutal army, having deprived the nation of Israel of its freedom 100 years earlier. Caesar, who imposed oppressive taxes to fund his coliseums and hippodromes, his gladiators and chariot races. Caesar, who within 40 years would have his armies attack Jerusalem, kill thousands, and destroy the temple. Caesar, who in 100 years would level the city of Jerusalem, rebuild it as an entirely Roman city with the Roman name Aelia Capitolina, and construct a temple to Jupiter on the Temple Mound. The strange, strange irony. This was Passover time. Passover was the festival of liberation and freedom, the birth of the nation, as God led his people out of Egypt. And here, in their cravings for earthly security, they pledged themselves to servitude. They sought continued oppression. Are we any different? Isn't our focus drawn repeatedly to this world, to its things, its wealth, its apparent security? We have a natural craving to try to make this earth our heaven and to want to never leave it. We have a sinful longing to enjoy its pleasures, even if they force God to take a back seat in our lives. And when Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, Satan is so quick to say, what kind of life is that? Did Jesus say that? Take him away. You don't need that. And who among us can say that he hasn't known the temptation to buy into the lie? Who among us can say that he has never fallen, that he has never chosen the world's way instead of Christ's way? Look within your heart honestly and you find sin. I find it in my heart. I want to excuse it. I want to blame my shortcomings and failures on others. I want to minimize my sin, reasoning that my sin is not as bad as someone else's. But I'm a sinner. So are you. God is holy and perfect, and we are not. Our anger, our pride, our selfishness, our cruelty, and our mixed-up priorities are acts of rebellion against God. God's law speaks clearly, be perfect. God has every right to turn his back on us and forsake us because of our sin. His law says he should abandon us to the eternal damnation which we deserve. Take him away, the crowd shouted. They didn't realize, as they led him to the cross on Golgotha, that Jesus is moving forward, the Father's plan to give lasting blessings. Thank God that our salvation does not depend, even a tiny little bit, on our faithfulness, our zeal, our commitment to follow Christ. Thank God it all depends on Jesus and his commitment to fulfill his Father's plans for our eternity. The Father's plan was so beautifully foreshadowed in the Passover festival, which every Jewish family was celebrating that very weekend. You remember how God commanded the people through Moses to take an innocent spotless lamb and slaughter it. That lamb's blood was painted on the doorposts of their homes, and when the angel of death did his horrific work that night in Egypt, the blood delivered the Israelites from death. This was pure grace, 
the Israelites weren't any less sinful than the Egyptians, but God had made them his people, and God provided his people with deliverance from their slavery. God was providing an even greater deliverance on Golgotha, the place of the skull, Calvary in Latin, just outside Jerusalem's city walls. Here was blood once again, but better blood, holy blood. Here was the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here was the blood that covers our sins, our guilt. Here was Jesus' blood that is our righteousness. Through this blood, God has removed your sins as far as the east is from the west, and he remembers them no more. Jesus shed his blood on Calvary. It dripped from the nail holes in his hands and feet. It oozed from the thorns piercing his head. It gushed from the spear thrust into the dead Jesus' side. Jesus shed his blood that day to fulfill God's gracious plan to give lasting blessings. Have you ever asked, why did God do it this way? Why did God the Father say it was necessary for his one and only Son to come into this world, live a humble, sinless life among us, and then die a most shameful and painful death? As the Almighty Creator of the universe, why did he give Adam and Eve and all subsequent humans the ability to rebel against him and his commands? Why didn't he create humans so they could choose only what was right? Or as the absolute ruler of the universe, why didn't he just pardon sinners? Like former President Yanukovych of Ukraine pardoned himself of his criminal past and made it illegal for anyone to talk about it. Or as the great physician, why didn't God cure us by injecting us with some potent medicine so that we can now produce the perfect good works which God's law demands? Well, we have part of the answer in the scriptures. Admit it, a pardon just doesn't seem just. A guilty man walks free without paying the right penalty for his offense. God wanted to be just. His law demands perfection and it demands punishment, eternal damnation for all who sin. God couldn't just ignore the law which he himself had given. The scripture also tells us why God didn't act like a miracle working doctor and make everyone righteous by giving them the ability, the divine medicine, they needed to keep the law and do the good works it requires. The Bible says that God took our salvation entirely upon himself to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us. God wanted us to thank and praise him for his goodness toward us, not praise ourselves because of the good things we have done to save ourselves. Paul tells us why God chose the method of saving us, which he did. Paul says God wanted to be both just and the one who justifies. God found a way to obey his law and yet justify the sinner, that is, to declare the sinner righteous. He found a way to obey the law's demand for perfect righteousness and not have to condemn all of us who are unrighteous, a way to punish sin and not have to punish us. He sent Jesus as our substitute and now gives us the credit for what Jesus did. We get the benefit of Jesus' righteousness through faith. You have to have faith to take the medicine your doctor prescribes before it can help you, but it's not your trust that helps you get well, it's the power of that medicine. You have to have faith to go to the bank to draw out money before you can get the benefit of the money on deposit, but it's not your faith that buys the groceries, it's the money. It takes faith to climb on an airplane, but it's the airplane, not your faith, that takes you to your desired destination. The only way we are saved is by believing in Jesus Christ as our Savior. But it's not our faith that saves us. It's the object of our faith. It's the rescue of Christ. Through faith, we grab hold of the rescue and receive it as our own, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us. We praise God's grace even more when we realize that even our faith is a gift of God's grace. He called us to faith through the power of his word and the power of baptism. Paul writes, by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Trusting in Jesus, a glorious future awaits you. St. John saw in a vision what we look like and he recorded it for us in the book of Revelation. 
He saw us as people who one day will have escaped the troubles of life in a sin-cursed world. Those in white robes, who are they? The elder asked John in a question, which he then himself answered. They are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Jesus was forsaken by God so that we will never be forsaken. God disowned his only begotten Son so he could adopt us as his children, his righteous children because he regards Jesus' righteousness as ours. God abandoned his son so that he could take us to heaven. God used his almighty power to turn the evil of the crowd which shouted, take him away, into good, eternal good for you and me, who have been called to faith in Jesus Christ. Righteousness now and everlasting blessings to come are ours because Jesus left behind the crowd with his worldly cravings and move forward the Father's plan to give lasting blessings. Amen. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen. For our prayer, we will speak the words of On My Heart and Print Your Image. Hymn 319. On my heart imprint your image, blessed Jesus, King of grace, that life's riches, cares, and pleasures have no power to hide your face. This the superscription be, Jesus, crucified for me, is my life, my hope's foundation, and my glory and salvation. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you for being with us for this recorded devotion. This coming week now is Holy Week. Look forward to seeing you in church for Palm Sunday, Bible class at 9, worship at 10. We will have special services on Thursday and Friday evening for Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. And then, of course, celebrate Easter the following Sunday. We hope that you'll be able to join us for all of those special services. I might give you a word about these crucifixes that you see here. Uh, this one here actually was carved by a man who was just a street carver in Monrovia, Liberia. I showed him a picture. He said, oh, I can do that. A couple days later, uh, he had carved this uh, crucifix of Christ. And this one here was carved by prisoners in one of the prison prisons in Ukraine. Their chaplain was a student at our seminary preparing to be a Ukrainian Lutheran pastor. And as a, a thank you gift from, from him and from his students, uh, he gave this gift to me. Certainly there's much beauty in the crucifixes of Christ and the love that goes into the carving and the making of them, but we'll never forget that for Christ itself, it was also a very painful, a horrible event that he willingly endured for us. God be with you.